the University of New Mexico Law and Mental Health Didactic Series. Uh, the series is hosted by UNM Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, as well as the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. We're so glad that you are all here to join us today. My name is Simone Fulian. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. So first, I just want to give a little bit of a reminder for next week, we're going to have Dr. Mark Cunningham, who's going to be presenting on differentiating delusional disorder from extreme political beliefs, an introduction to the 17 factor model. I'm personally really excited about that because it seems like I keep getting a slew of QAnon incel cases lately. So pretty excited about that one because it's, it's a tricky topic for sure. Next, for our talk today, please ask questions in the Q&A. Um, the presenters have indicated that they'll kind of be checking on them and maybe answering as we go through, but as usual, basically be answering most of the questions at the end. So just put them in whenever you feel comfortable and just know that we'll get to most of them at the end of the talk. As always, we try our best to answer all of the questions, but sometimes we just can't get to everybody. So we apologize in advance if we don't get to yours. If you want those who you use, but you're on a tight schedule, you just remember you have to stay till the hour and you can jump off. Sometimes we stay a little bit afterwards to answer questions. Um, I think we forgot to ask you both if that was okay. Is how you guys yeah, have a little bit of time afterwards? Actually. Okay, great. So, so we'll be staying a little longer afterwards to answer questions, but if you have to jump off, just grab that CU link and um, fill that out and you can jump off right at the hour. Um, now for what we've all been waiting for, I'd like to introduce our speakers for the day. So we have Dr. Julia McLawson and attorney Greg McLawson. Julia is a licensed psychologist in Washington state and a registered psychologist in British Columbia. Uh, she, which I should clarify is Canada. I think most people know that, but I guess I should add that. Um, she earned an undergraduate degree from Stanford University followed <coughs> by a graduate degree from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. She conducts evidence-driven psychological evaluations in civil, criminal, and Im immigration contexts. Her scholarship addressed best practices in forensic domain and clinical decision-making. Greg is an immigration lawyer. Um, I was picking his brain a little bit earlier because I need American citizenship. So that was really interesting to get some of that insight. He earned an undergraduate degree from the University of Washington and a JD from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. His firm, Sound Immigration, has been centered in the cloud since 2012. His prof uh, professional interests span topics including how lawyers can use technology to better serve their clients, immigration support under the form I-864, affidavit of support and psychological topics on in immigration law. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Julia and Greg. We are so grateful for you taking the time to be here today. And on behalf of UNM, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for presenting. I'm gonna turn it over to you and I'm gonna go dark until I need to field questions for you guys. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks very much. Um, Thank you so much. And I'll add that it's an absolute honor to be um, part of the lecture series. Do you want to tag anything on the introduction? No. Back okay. So we're required to give the disclaimer. Please. Absolutely. So um, neither of us have a financial relationship to this program. Um, both of us are independently wealthy and live on a modest castle, the private island. O oops, actually. Um, the views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers, that's the two of us, and do not necessarily represent the views, policies, and positions of the University of New Mexico. And we might encounter some instances when even Greg and I have differences of opinions as well. So um, in terms of learning objectives, these are the um, things that we hope that you walk away from our talk um, feeling more comfortable knowing. And this is basically a 40,000 foot overview of some of the common referrals that forensic psychologists might encounter in the immigration context. And we're going to um, give a little more time and attention to hardship evaluations because, and those tend to be the most common referral and also arguably are the most complex as well. So these are some of the underlying concepts that are in a sense so basic that they go without saying. And I'm not going to read all of these out because I presume that everybody attending is able to do that on their own. Um, a couple topics I would like to call out are the value of cross-cultural, linguistic, 
and other diversity considerations in doing these types of evaluations. An example that comes up often in the work I do are cultural idioms of distress. And there's a, I believe a psychiatrist in Harvard, Devin Hinton, who has done some fascinating research on this topic. And some of his work is included in a reference slide at the end of our talk. Um, another overarching point is that we are not here to tell you how to do high quality forensic evaluations. Um, I, I am of the mindset that that process looks pretty similar, at least if you take enough of the bird's eye view, regardless of the specific referral issue and the relevant legal standard. And rather our goal is to simply introduce you to some of the common referrals that um, come up in immigration law. So you can be aware of the legal contours and from there have a sense of how to clarify the referral issue, determine what clinical data are going to be relevant in structuring your evaluation process, and have a sense of what psycholegal opinions are actually going to assist the trier of fact. Hi, folks. Really nice to speak to you today. So again, I'm the immigration lawyer, not a psychologist, not psychology trained. I guess I could have an undergrad degree, but that was ages ago. Um, one, basically what we're giving here is a condensed version of a postdoctoral fellowship training that we used to give um, at Western State Hospital here in Washington. And one preliminary point that I like to make um, for folks approaching this, um, maybe for the first time without a lot of background in immigration law, you know, for a lot of US law, um, especially criminal law, which uh, many of you may be familiar with, we have a very rich um, tradition that of course goes back to the British common law um, courts spanning hundreds of years. So when we have models for uh, culpability in the criminal context, we have actus rea and mens rea, and there is hundreds of years of case law thinking about how we deal with that. And also um, obviously more recently, um, lots of case law and lots of theory about how we deal with that in the mental health context. And immigration law is not like that. What we have in the immigration law arena is this amalgam of um, acts of Congress that have been passed um, since the late 1800s. And immigration law, as we've seen in recent years, is a bit of a political football. So what we have in the immigration context is not a very cohesive, well-theorized uh, world of legal constructs. Rather, what we have is just this melange of different things that have been cobbled together over hundreds of years. So it's, um, it's different in that sense um, in significant ways from the criminal law context. But immigration law in the US has, since its very inception, um, had psycholegal constructs embedded in it. You know, a lot of, of course, what US immigration law is concerned with is who are we letting in and who are we keeping out? And since the very first federal statutes on immigration were passed, um, at the top of the list were idiots and lunatics and epileptics and insane persons, um, professional beggars, amateur beggars presumably being permissible, um, and anarchists, so no Antifa. <laughs> So this was, you know, when the federal Congress sat down at the top of their list about who they were concerned with. What I'm going to do um, in 15 minutes <laughs> is do some <laughs> cherry picking through the very vast um, Immigration and Nationality Act to call out some of the primary examples of where we see psycholegal constructs in US immigration law. This is not an exhaustive list. These are kind of the, the chief players. And then um, for the second half of our remaining time, we'll kind of drill down on one particular example that usually, I think it's fair to say, accounts for the bulk of private referral questions. And to foreshadow, those are called extreme hardship waivers. Violence Against Women Act. Um, somewhat of a misnomer since it applies um, to folks of all gender identities. Um, most US immigration law is driven by family-sponsored immigration. So that's petitions by um, parents, siblings, and spouses. If you are a spouse-sponsored intending immigrant, so you're trying to achieve status through a US citizen, 
Um, that is a scary situation if your US citizen spouse turns out to be abusive. So absent, absent the provisions I'm gonna speak about here under VAWA, in, a foreign national would have their immigration uh, future imperiled if they were relying on their US citizen spouse to get status and then spouse becomes abusive and they're put in this jeopardy of, do I stay in the relationship and hope I can normalize my status or do I bail on the marriage and forfeit my chance to um, residency? So VAWA provides a alternative strategy for individuals who are subject to abuse. It's called a self petition because the US citizen isn't petitioning, rather it's the foreign national. And the individual has to show that they are battered or subject to extreme cruelty. So this is one context in which um, forensic psychologists might come into play. And the focus there um, is primarily on the quantum of harm. So this would often be the case where um, maybe there hasn't been a physically violent incident that resulted in a police report and a prosecution but the person was abusive over a period of time. And you bring a psychologist into the picture to put some flesh on the bones of what the person's experience was at the hands of the US citizen because there isn't an institutional record of it. I'll turn it over to Jules for an example of that in just a moment. Um, but I wanna to touch on a similar legal construct that exists. Um, so again, this idea of we don't want to tie foreign nationals to an abusive relationship. Um, for folks who gain residency based on a marriage of two years or less, so new marriage, new status, um, Congress put into effect some fraud amendments. The idea basically being that we want the couple to check back in at the two year mark and say, yes, it was a real marriage. We didn't just get the green card and bail. So same sort of problem. The person gets that probationary two year status and then things aren't working very well. The US citizen is becoming abusive. Congress gives to the uh, foreign national the option of bailing on the marriage and instead of petitioning with their US citizen spouse, instead they can show that they were battered or subject to extreme cruelty by that spouse. So the same basic idea is VAWA that you show, look, it was a real marriage, but I bailed because the US citizen was abusive. And so I'm demonstrating that the person was um, subjecting me to extreme cruelty. You wanna mm -hmm. mention that example? Absolutely. I will also underscore that it's very unlikely a forensic psychologist is going to get brought in to um, these types of referrals unless the abuse has not been documented elsewhere. Um, so it, um, physical violence is often, not always, um, often documented in police reports or um, medical records. And a forensic psychologist will typically be addressing ongoing emo emotional abuse, exploitation, um, a hostile control, and so on. Um, one example of a case that I recently um, took on involved evaluating a woman who had um, come over to the United States from the Punjab region of India, and her husband subjected her to all sorts of isolation and financial exploitation, forcing her to work for a family company and without any sort of compensation and extreme and um, verbal abuse. And so my role involved um, certainly presenting her narrative and also contextualizing her accounts of the um, traumatic distress and other um, psychological consequences she experienced from the abuse in terms of what we would expect according to relevant literature, as well as presenting assessment results that in this case, fortunately, um, showed um, that validity skills were intact and gave, I would say, a sense of authenticity to her story. Another um, completely different route to residential status exists for certain individuals who are the victim of qualifying crime. These are referred to as U visa. And, and the basic idea behind this is 
this concern that immigrants without status are going to be reticent to go to the authorities when they are legitimately the victims of crime because out of a fear that local law enforcement will do what local law enforcement um, has been threatening to do um, increasingly, which is turn that individual over to ICE, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. So go report a crime and instead of getting the perpetrator prosecuted, the victim gets thrown in jail. Um, that's not what Congress wanted to happen. So there's a list of qualifying crimes. They're relatively serious things like robbery or um, serious assault. And you as the int intending immigrant need to demonstrate that the crime occurred, that you cooperated with law enforcement in pursuing the crime, and that it resulted in substantial harm to you. Substantial harm, that's the operative term there. So that can be relatively straightforward. Guy gets rolled on the street, gets his arm uh, broken in the course of a robbery, substantial harm, it, that's easy. Well, um, what if the individual witnesses a um, abuse of his mother, say, what then? Well, the scope of the concept of a victim for U visas can be broader than what we would typically think of as a victim in the most straightforward way. So if you get your arm broken by the robber, you're clearly a victim. If you are a witness seeing your mother being abused by your father, um, you might also qualify as a victim. But in that context, teasing out um, the nexus from the actus reus, the, the bad thing that happened, to the substantial harm um, experienced by the foreign national, that's trickier. And that's where you might bring in a psychologist. And so a recent um, case where my role was to um, clarify the connection between um, in this case, it was a school shooting and the distress and functional impairments that somebody who witnessed um, a friend get um, shot um, during the school shooting involved a um, high school student who was in a cafeteria when one of his acquaintances opened fire and the person I evaluated was not struck by a bullet, but a very close friend who was also nearby my examinee was struck by a bullet. And um, my, the scope of my evaluation addressed traumatic distress and other psychological consequences that this person experienced through witnessing the school shooting. And it's my understanding that um, my report from my evaluation was useful in helping USCIS understand that the person I evaluated was indeed harmed by the crime, even though he was not physically struck by any of the bullets. And now for something completely different. Um, so these applications that we've been speaking about just now are affirmative applications. So they're you're out there in the community and then you've chosen to apply for an immigration benefit. Well, what about people who are in removal proceedings, formerly known as deportation proceedings? Um, super quick background, immigration proceedings in the US are in a sort of court, but not really court, called the Executive Office of Immigration Review. So this is not an Article III court, um, which is what um, real capital C federal courts are. Um, rather, this is an administrative organ that exists within the Department of Justice. Um, I don't want to speak derogatively um, about the agency as a whole, but I think it is it is fair to say that the um, the rigors of capital C court, oh, I don't know, things like rules of evidence, um, those just don't apply in the Executive Office of Immigration Review. So this is a totally different um, standard of practice and standard of adjudication than what any of you all would be familiar with either in federal court or in a state court of general jurisdiction. In a criminal um, state or federal court, um, defendants of course have a constitutional right to um, proceed with competency. The basic idea of course being that you can't fairly hold somebody um, to account for culpable conduct if they're not able to participate in the process that holds them to account. Competency exists also within deportation proceedings. However, 
there is not a constitutional right to it. It's rather created by federal law. Now, the federal case that the um, canonical case that discusses this standard, um, matter of mom in 2011, sets forth a standard that's sort of like dusky for anybody who does um, criminal competency uh, standards. Uh, you know, we could bicker about the differences in, a, in wording, but, you know, let's just say it's, it's roughly like dusky. Mm -hmm. Um, so, okay, you know, that sort of makes sense. Um, the person is facing deportation, extraordinarily um, important consequences for that individual, sometimes called legal death. So they are getting sent permanently out of the US. So what happens if you find somebody incompetent? Well, you know, what happens in criminal court is that person, the, everything stops. You know, you do not proceed against that person unless and until um, competency can be restored not in deportation proceedings. So in deportation proceedings, we put into place safeguards. So um, you might have a friend show up with the person. You might, um, oh, what are some of the silly ones? Um, close the hearing to the public. You might uh, put in extra effort to find the person a lawyer, but there is not a requirement that proceedings stop until competency is restored. If this sounds internally inconsistent to you, it does to us as well. And we wrote a paper about it. It's in the notes at the end of the slides. I hate to even call it an argument because it seems so obvious it's hard to, to really bicker about it. But to us, it seems flatly self-contradictory to inquire about competence, endorsing the view that competence is required for a fair adjudication, and then proceed in a context where we're not even pretending that competence was restored. Instead, you've got the guy's mom at the proceeding. Or you simply tell the respondent that they can leave the room while the hearing proceeds. Right, yeah, that's, that's one of the greatest <laughs> ones, proceed in their absence. Um, there, there is a competency panel um, for um, deportation proceedings. So this is something that private practitioners can can be involved in, um, but it's primarily through that panel um, organized by the court. Sorry, I stole your point there. Again, um, like state uh, criminal proceedings, um, there are some occasions in which US immigration law asks for a behavioral forecast. So going back to the family based sponsorship process, if Joe American decides that he is going to petition for his third lovely foreign fiance. And whoops, um, Joe has a serious uh, record of sexual abuse resulting in a conviction. Adam Walsh Act swoops in. And Adam Walsh Act says that Joe American can't serve for that individual's um, petition unless he can demonstrate a zero risk, and that is not a typo, a zero risk of sexual reoffense. Um, there are also forecasts that are used by substance uh, in substance and uh, alcohol abuse, but um, Adam Walsh is perhaps the most striking example because who is at zero risk of sexual offense? Um, quick answer, no one. And but. <laughs> Um, and so when undertaking Adam Walsh evaluations, um, it's really important for the forensic psychologists to um, use their role as a platform to educate um, USCIS or the USCIS officer who's going to be reading the report to explain the impossibility of anybody presenting as absolute nullity an absence of risk for any sort of behavior. And in order for that to happen, somebody would need to um, not be sentient. And then to undertake a comprehensive evaluation. And um, I would recommend using um, static and dynamic actuarial assessment procedures as consistent with best practice standards to explain what somebody's static risk is and then um, to use the dynamic risk assessment to demonstrate what they have done to mitigate their risk moving forward. I'll add that Adam Walsh evaluations are probably the highest scrutiny of 
uh, the types of immigration psychological evaluations that tend to come up. And I would encourage anybody who undertakes these to ensure that from the outset, they have all of the relevant materials. So past treatment records, um, Department of Correction records, police reports, and so on. It's very common to get requests for evidence in these types of evaluations that would come through the immigration lawyer. And it's wonderful when you as the evaluator have crossed your T's and dotted your I's from the get-go. David, just uh, registering your question, we will certainly circle back to that later. Um, this is one that's um, probably never gonna cross your desk as a referral issue, but we, we found it to be an interesting one. Um, and there's a paper cited at the end of our slides. The Immigration and Nationality Act actually has a large category of medical inadmissibility. So folks with transmissible diseases of public health significance, do any come to mind, um, are inadmissible. Um, tuberculosis would be one, uh, COVID will be another. There's also a category within that for folks with mental illness that poses a um, hazard to the public. And that includes mental health um, issues that are likely to result in self-harm. And if you have a situation in which an individual has previously <clears throat> engaged in self-harming behavior, you see this a lot in immigration law, that past act creates a presumption going forward that the person will engage in self-harm. So you have to kind of rebut that. Uh, this is a context in which a either a panel physician, that's a a physician identified by the immigration agency or the Department of State takes a first swing at the evaluation, but has authority under the statute to pull in an outside um, examiner. Um, this doesn't happen a lot in terms of outside um, referrals. We think it's um, interesting and significant, primarily given the high base rate of self-harming behavior within the general public. To us, it's actually, it's almost surprising that this doesn't come up more often as a ground of inadmissibility. And do you want to address this Adam Walsh question now? Yeah, okay, so, and, and Michael, uh, this is primarily not in the court context. So Adam Walsh acts are visa adjudications or green card um, applications. I had mentioned, um, how to put this delicately, kind of this, a different standard of adjudication within some immigration context. So if I were to go in front of a federal judge and say, all right, judge, the legal standard is zero, re, zero chance of reoffense. And here's my expert. And she says, well, I can't possibly say that because nobody's at zero chance of reoffense. The answer from the federal judge is, well, thanks for playing. If you can't show me that you meet the legal standard, your, evident, your expert says she can't say that, um, you have lost. Not so in the visa adjudication process. And I think our, our view is just that there is an understanding by adjudicators that yeah, it is an impossible standard. And so if you have an expert who's sitting there saying, look, my actuarial instruments say this is as low of a risk as the person possibly could be, that's close enough for the visa context, mm -hmm. even if that's not something you'd probably get away with in, in a summary judgment argument to a judge. And so basically, this is a situation where USCIS officers don't actually follow the law as it's worded. In, in the most hyper-technical sense. Exactly. Okay, extreme hardship waivers, we will circle back to. That's a very large, meaty topic of its own. Um, let's hit asylum pretty quick. Um, so asylum, it's been, been in the news for the better part of a decade now. Um, it, it's, of course, ultimately for people who face persecution on one of several protected grounds, including uh, the ones listed here. If you are a asylum seeker who has fled Guatemala, um, walked across a couple countries and shown up at the Southwest border, um, you could probably imagine um, the size of the file cabinet of evidence that you brought with you, um, which would be to say none. So asylum applicants at the Southern border or at any um, foreign um, location they might be applying often have zero documentary evidence uh, to support their claim. So it is very common to bring in an outside evaluator to talk about the person's presenting symptomology 
and to answer the question of whether it's consistent with a person who has um, spent time in a gulag because they've been um, targeted because of their political view. Absolutely. And uh, asylum evaluations are notoriously complex and time consuming often, often because the person in need of the evaluation has limited trust of um, medical and mental health providers. There are often cultural barriers, often linguistic barriers. And on top of that, um, commonly, um, there is trauma as well and avoidance around that trauma. And to work with somebody to establish the level of rapport you need to conduct um, the evaluation necessary takes a lot of time, often multiple sessions. And it's a, uh, for clear reasons that I don't think I need to explain, uh, these evaluations have a lot of merit associated with them. Um, it, I, I would like to think, might be a terrific opportunity for graduate students to get involved in this area of practice. Yeah, so unlike um, self-harming inadmissibility problems, um, vow, or asylum rather, is a context where there is a huge need mm -hmm. all across the country for folks who are willing to take on pro bono evaluation. So that is a primo opportunity for grad students who want to make an impact. Less kind of small example, um, this is in the vein of VAWA in terms of kind of humanitarian uh, stopgap measures. We have um, special immigrant uh, juvenile status is available. Let's see if I can think of a quick uh, scenario. So, I mean, this is largely for minors who have been, in essence, abandoned by their family. Um, oftentimes, the person will arrive at the southern border by themselves, but not always, you know, a lot of times you'll have a situation where a family breaks down within the United States. And this is always involving a family law um, court. And what you need in that context is a finding by the judge that the person was abused and subject to neglect. You might also bring in an outside expert to put some flesh on the bones of that factual argument that the person was abused and neglected by their, by their foreign national parent. And finally, just like in uh, many areas of forensic practice, you might be fielding calls from attorneys who say something to the effect of, well, doctor, I just need an evaluation that shows, and then they um, insert what they are expecting your opinion and or recommendation to be. Um, oftentimes, immigration attorneys are approaching uh, their work with experts with limited experience and limited understanding of the expert's role and the limitations of the expert's role as well. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, Jules and Dr. McLaughlin and I go, go back and forth on this a lot. You know, I think it's it's easy for the brilliant experts of the world um, who are used to looking at, you know, you know, limited number of forensic referral issues under a microscope um, to remember that when you're speaking to an immigration attorney who's working on 50 cases, one of which involves the first psycho legal issue she's ever seen in her life you know, the, the level of sophistication that attorney is going to bring to that referral question isn't a lot. And you are definitely in the superior position of mm -hmm. helping that attorney to think about what she's got in front of her. And so it's incumbent on the psychologist to use this as an opportunity to um, help the attorney understand what's involved in working with experts, help them um, from the outset clarify that referral issue and proactively engage in expectation management. Um, I learned this the hard way where I undertook an Adam Walsh evaluation for um, an attorney who read my report and was absolutely horrified that I dared to include any information about the examinee's um, masturbatory fantasies. 
And so I needed to um, explain to the attorney that no, indeed, I was not trying to throw his client under the bus and that it was indeed relevant to my opinions and could not be taken out. And so since that experience, I've um, tried to be far more proactive in ensuring that um, the referring attorney and I are on the same page when it comes to the scope of my role and the type of clinical information I will be including in my evaluation and report. So hardship waivers. To the extent uh, you care to, uh, want to, or are interested in encountering immigration work in your private practice, if that's the arena you're coming from, hardship waivers have a good chance of being uh, what you will have referred to you. This is one of the contexts in which, well, they're very common, first of all, but also a context in which um, experts can play an absolutely pivotal role in a case. Again, just to kind of um, locate where this is in the universe of immigration issues, um, this is not part of DACA or, or DREAM Act, but if you think about what DACA is, this is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, the limited benefits that are available to children. Um, this is created under the Obama administration who arrived um, under age 16 and have spent their lives in the United States. That's a whole class of people who often have zero um, way to normalize their immigration status. And so there was a recognition by the Obama administration of we gotta give these kids something. So there was an exception in the administrative code put into effect that basically gave these folks a limited um, way to normalize their status through the recognition that the otherwise straightforward application of US immigration law just worked an unfair harm on this entire class of people. And that's sort of what hardship waivers are, albeit in a very different context. It is a humanitarian escape valve that prevents immigration law from being too harshly applied in a very specific circumstance. Um, a primary way this arises is due to what is referred to as the three and 10 year bars. The idea here is that if you overstay your status in the United States for either six months or one year and then depart the country, you are subject to three or 10 years bar on your ability to return. The reason this is of critical importance is that if you have not entered the US um, through an inspected port of entry, you are normally not eligible to apply for a green card. So if you entered illegally, you've been here your whole life, um, you're married to a US citizen, you have no criminal record, you often cannot normalize your status without departing the United States and applying for a visa let's say it's in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Well, that might not sound like a big deal, except for this three and 10 year bar. So you've got what would otherwise be a slam dunk marriage-based visa case, but as soon as you step out of the country, you are barred for returning from 10 years. So what we have codified is an exception to that, which is that if the applicant can demonstrate adequate hardship not to the applicant, but to the US citizen family, that person can proceed with their visa application. But extreme hardship, what does that mean? We identify, um, and there's an article fleshing this out at the end of the slides, um, kind of a four element test that I'll walk through in terms of what the cycle, what the standard is for deciding whether a US citizen is going to experience hardship. First, you've got to qualify. You've got to be a qualifying family member. Um, I don't want to get super granular on this, but depending on what sort of application you're talking about, different family members will be the qualifying relative. So as a psychologist who's, been asked, who's being asked to participate in this, the first thing you've got to do is identify who within the family is the qualifying relative. And it's really not straightforward because, for example, a child might be a qualifying relative, but the concept of child is a statutorily defined term. So you have to make sure you're clear from the attorney about who within a family system um, is a qualifying relative and 
in this case, a child. And I strongly recommend um, asking the referring attorney to clarify um, these details for you. An additional twist <clears throat> is that under the statute, only a, only hardship to a qualifying relative matters. So this is usually spouse, parent, or child. But um, family systems are complicated. The girlfriend of the visa applicant is not a qualifying relative because she's not a spouse. But the girlfriend and the applicant have a child. Well, what happens if um, the girlfriend life totally falls apart for her and um, you know the child is impacted? Well, that's a situation in which the analysis of the, uh, the girlfriend's experience might be very pivotal to understanding what a child is likely to face if a visa application is ultimately denied. And I'm sorry, I meant, I meant to start out with um, maybe just two examples to, to frame this. So, I mean, again, we're talking about a situation here where the foreign national visa applicant is applying abroad. Just to give you an idea of like a slam dunk case, if that uh, foreign national was married to a US citizen who was undergoing you know, third stage cancer treatment at the University of Washington, getting experimental medication she can't get anywhere else, um, and was relying on the foreign national to administer and participate in her health care. Um, that's kind of your slam dunk hardship case where um, the fact of the visa applicant's uh, absence is just going to be crushingly devastating to, in this case, the person's physical health in a demonstrative way. Um, what, it's, what gets more difficult is where you have a situation where there's not a super acute mental or physical ailment by the US citizen family member, um, but we're talking about dissolving a family here. Um, so there's definitely going to be an impact there. And that's, that's where, that's the arena of cases that get involved with the psychologist. Um, okay, so first, first element is identifying the qualifying relative. Second is causation. Um, the person's um, departure has to result in the hardship. And um, as you, as a forensic psychologist, are establishing this nexus between the, uh, either a family staying together and relocating to another country, or in the alternative, um, part of the family remaining in the United States and the foreign national um, relocating to the to some other country. Do you want me to talk about that real quick, just before you mention? Oh, sure. Yeah, you can give a little more context. Yeah, sorry. So the thing that Jules was about to mention is when it comes to causation, the immigration agency is going to think that there are two options. Mm -hmm. So remember, we've got foreign applicant going down to apply for the visa. Well, there one of two things could happen. Either the US citizen family stays put, they've got their house in Washington, and they've got their life here, they're going to stay there. In that case, the question is, how does the fact of the foreign national separation from the family impact them? But it is possible that the family would relocate, and in this case to Mexico. So applicant goes down there, family follows. What is the impact on the family if they go there? The agencies will assume that either is a possibility absent a factual demonstration that one or the other is likely to occur. Um, I, I may be stealing your point here, but um, an example would be that if there was a court order requiring a child to stay in Washington state because of a prior um, custody arrangement. Okay, well that child can't relocate to Me Mexico. So in that case, we know that there will be a separation. Exactly. Uh, but you were talking about the importance of literature oh, uh, causation. Yeah, I was um, about to emphasize that um, forensic psychologists are going to be asked to address um, basically prognosis, like the prognosis of a qualifying relative or relatives mental condition in both of these hypothetical scenarios. And 
it's absolutely critical in addition to doing a thorough evaluation with you know proper assessment procedures that you um, tether your forecast about prognosis to relevant literature which is an opportunity um, i would say to get rather creative in terms of how you are framing your opinions and recommendations let's go back to this after we talk about factors that, that sounds good just being mindful of time so again uh, two possibilities separation or relocation so the meat of these evaluations turns on the third element of the test um, which is the magnitude of the hardship and what we're talking about here in straight english terms is how bad is this going to be for the family um, it's a broad context i mean how what are the ways in which either losing a father or relocating to a remote village in Guatemala, how is that going to impact a family? Well, that is a broad question. And there's, there's no crisp legal standard that you will find in the Immigration and Nationality Act. Instead, the law um, through case law points to a list of factors that can, can be considered. Um, so prime examples of this would include family ties in the US and community ties. So if you have a family here in Washington who is deeply involved in their church communities, they've got a network of aunts and uncles who live close by and they get together, you know, every week for family gatherings. And that person is facing the prospect of getting shipped off to Guatemala that's a huge um, loss for that individual. <clears throat> and what you don't see on this list is uh, mental health specifically, um, but it is well established that mental health um, impact by itself can be considered, but also as Jules will explain how any of these factors might interact with mental health. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely critical for a forensic psychologist to stay in their lane when they're offering opinions about um, the, uh, the likely prognosis of somebody's mental condition in this type of evaluation. And um, instead of offering opinions about what is likely to happen to somebody if they lose their job or if they have an economic setback, and it's key to explain how those losses and other domains of somebody's life would have bearing on their mental condition. And so always tie it back to psychological functioning. So here's a good example of that. Um, financial impact can be considered. Well, in the vast majority of cases, um, separating or sorry, relocating to the foreign country is going to result in a net loss of income to the family. So one of the things you will see in tons and tons and tons of decisions um, resulting in denials is verbiage to the effect of economic loss by itself does not constitute extreme hardship. Well, you know, losing a job and losing a career is more, more than just money. So what if you have a person who is um, a forensic psychologist and has a flourishing practice here in Seattle and is going to be forced to relocate to a country where she's not licensed? Well, that loss isn't simply about the loss of salary. It's a loss of self-identity and you know, deeply um, ingrained in the value structure of that person's life. Well. You know, that's that's something that we can't talk about, that we can't, for, as a lawyer, um, illustrate merely by showing the person's pay stubs. That's where a psychologist is really important in teasing out what it is that the person's losing and what that might mean to the person. Mm -hmm. So again, um, although not listed, in the statute, it is absolutely black letter law that mental health um, impact has to be considered. Um, and it's also black letter law that a psychologist evaluation must be considered in the context of adjudicating these cases. 
you have a, a good example you can think of, of you know, just kind of a fact pattern of case GFX. Oh, goodness. Um, I, I think I know one example sticks out in my mind because um, hardship evaluations are extremely different from one another. Um, each is a very unique snowflake. Um, a common theme that comes up, however, involves uh, families relocating to a foreign country, so the possibility of that happening, and losing access to uh, US quality health or mental health care. And in the absence of that type of support, what might be likely to happen to um, people who do have mental health vulnerabilities or who might have mental health vulnerabilities with the stress of separation from their social support system. A another common example that comes up is when children are facing the prospect of moving away from the United States and might have special needs or other require other forms of developmentally appropriate support in the absence of those supports in the foreign country what might happen to them over time and how would that affect their development so one vexing issue um, that i know dr mclawson grapples with all the time um, is let's just stick with that educational example so the child is on an individual education plan here, um, autism spectrum, the individual education plan seems to be really critical to that child's functioning. Um, and they're going to go to a small village in Guatemala. Well, look, we know, we know that the standard of educational um, individualization that's going to be available to that child, it, there's no way it's going to be close to here. At the same time, is Dr. McLawson an expert on the educational system on that particular, you know, Todos Santos uh, village? Probably not. Um, so it, it, it places the evaluator in a challenging situation because the factual details of what the relocation entails um, are both important and also may not be especially well known to the evaluator on a granular level. Um, I think there hasn't been a super great um, solution to that that we've hit on over the years. Well, what we've usually said in talks and in our paper is to, to conjugate the evaluation and the conditional. So, you know, if availability to this sort of individualized education plan is lost, you know, here's how I think it would impact the child and leave to the attorney the factual issue of will you prove to the to prove to the adjudicator what the standard of education is. I don't know what that is because that's that's not my job. Exactly. The attorney is equipped to um, retain country specific experts if needed or tie in media coverage or other sorts of evidence to bolster the evaluators um, conditional or I guess hypothetical language in their report. I want to make sure there wasn't anything I want to circle back to before we discuss um, questions. So perhaps um, the final thing to say about hardship evaluations is simply the context in which this occurs. So many evaluators um, may be familiar with court-based evaluations where you've submitted an evaluation um, to an attorney, but there's a chance, probably varies uh, based on context, there's a chance that you'll be pulled into court to testify about the uh, findings and conclusions that you made. And that's not how um, hardship evaluations work. This is submitted um, with a large packet of paper that gets shipped off to a central USCIS processing facility, and you're never going to see the adjudicator that reviews these. Now, I'm not saying that's good, bad, or anything, um, but that's a different sort of adjudication process than court um, proceedings that you might be familiar with. Um, and these often involve vast sums of documentation. So you might have thousands of pages of documentation supporting a hardship claim, um, and the evaluation would be one component of that. And with the exception of um, when somebody is in removal proceedings and hardship becomes an issue, um, in those situations, a psychologist might be asked to provide expert testimony addressing their written report in an immigration court. That's very unusual. And I will say um, anecdotally, every time I've been 
asked to appear in immigration court. Um, the government attorney um, has stipulated to my report and I have been excused from the courtroom. So I've never actually taken the stand. And I just realized that we deleted um, the slide explaining the final element of our test, which is um, the, the final part of proving extreme hardship is that you have to show that the hardship the person is, is likely to experience exceeds the um, hardship that an average individual would experience in those situations. It's comparative, right? So the challenge there is that there isn't really a rich literature about this, you know, um, leaving aside the fact of how how very specific this is to family circumstances, um, there's a dearth of literature that you can point to to say, okay, you know, this um, Panamanian family, you know, is relocating from a suburb in Houston to a small village in Panama. Um, what does that mean for the average family that does that? <laughs> um, so that, that's tough. Um, you're working without a well-established base rate, even though the legal standard requires you um, to make some sort of case as to how this family is different um, than the average, because this is, again, against the context that anybody in this context, anybody who's subject to that 10-year bar to reentry, of course that's, gonna, that's going to cause hardship. Mm -hmm. That's not the question. Um, the question is, whatever that base rate of misery is, can you convince the adjudicator that you're, you know, a, a good step above that um, standard misery? With that, oops, daisies, we will open it for questions. And I can start by fielding the question that David has here. Just get the slides back up. Anthony, is that sure working now? Slides aren't especially okay, I have just posted the link into the chat. Okay. So um, David, I'll just repeat David's question here, um, that I alluded perhaps in a joc jocular manner, um, indeed I did, to Antifa. <laughs> How would individuals from group like them be viewed by forensic psychology in conjunction with jurisprudence, songs being unduly political in a legal um, clinical context? Um, so this, this may not directly answer that question, David. Uh, first of all, group membership in all sorts of um, political organizations can potentially have inadmissibility contact, uh, implications by itself. So groups that have been identified as terrorist organizations, that results in a form of inadmissibility. Um, likewise, criminal conduct related to those groups could result in inadmissibility. Um, I think actually next week's seminar <laughs> sounds directly on point um, to that question. Um, there, there's not a context, I mean, I, I don't want to riff on that theme from next week. Um, there's not really a context in which a psychologist in the immigration process would be to would be asked um, whether a belief driving membership in Antifa or other organization was delusional in nature or not. So it wouldn't matter if you're um, a member of um, Al Qaeda uh, because you have a command hallucination about your need to join. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's just a matter of strict liability and your membership kills your eligibility. We have a great question here about um, mental health inadmissibility in the context of an asylum application, where um, I'm just going to use the example of if an asylum applicant has engaged, let's say, in non suicidal self injurious behavior, could that trounce their asylum application or otherwise jeopardize it? Awesome scenario. I yeah. think that's a horrible scenario. That's not what no. I mean, but, but intellectually very interesting. Um, first of all, a few things come to mind. First of all, there are broad categories of inadmissibility waivers that are available to asylum applicants. Off the top of my head, I don't recall if um, this would be one of them, um, but there's a good chance it is. Uh, the other question is um, how this would come up. I mean, first of all, I, I don't believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, as an ethical matter, you would have any duty to disclose the self-harming behavior. Um, on the other hand, it might very well bolster the case that you're making for that asylum applicant because you're arguing that that self-harming behavior is part of uh, symptomology person experience. So um, 
what might get you out of that situation is that to trigger the presumption of future self-harm, the self-harming behavior has to be within the past 12 months. So if you're past that window, you might have a safe harbor there. Um, within that safe harbor 12 months, I would probably check with the attorney to see if there's a, an admissibility waiver available mm -hmm. for it. And that um, is an extremely important take home message um, for our talk, which is um, it's really important for the forensic psychologists to work closely with the attorney to be able to call out um, pieces of clinical data that if included in the um, written report from the evaluation uh, could jeopardize an applicant's case and to discuss with the attorney how to um, include relevant information in a judicious manner. Oswald asks if the Violence Against Women Act also applies to men. Um, yes, it does. We had the W in quotation marks, but thought that was a little bit too cutesy. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, as I think I had mentioned in passing, um, gender identity is irrelevant for the valid provisions. And same thing goes for I-751 waivers. That's a conditional residency mm -hmm. waiver. Um, in, in fact, since DOMA was um, struck down, I hope this isn't an overbroad statement, but you know, at least in theory, most provisions of the Immigration and Nationality Act should, uh, should be applied in a gender neutral manner. So you can't think of a context where a benefit or defense is available um, based on gender. Although gender dynamics, of course, are very often mm -hmm. important. Anthony, I believe we are caught up with questions. Yeah, it looks like that was all the questions. Thank you so much to both of you. I, I personally found it really very interesting. I don't do this type of work myself, so it's always really interesting to kind of hear about other areas of practice. So thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and for agreeing to present with us. And I think we'll probably hang on just for a few minutes so folks can grab that CEU link that's posted in the chat. Um, actually, we have one more question. Um, and so, can, it looks like the inquirer might have cut. Yeah, it sounds off. like there's the question drops off precipitously. There we go. Yes, I'll answer there the first go. part. <laughs> I'll answer the first part before I type. So, I'll, I'll, I'll just give it a minute for the second part to drop in. And so, the question is going to be about the U visa process. Okay, so Dr. Bobadilla asks, um, first of all, to talk about the U visa process. Um, so first of all, um, it, it sucks, for lack of a better word. U visa availability is years and years behind right now. So a U petition filed today might get approved in five years um, or might not. The application starts by getting a certification from a qualifying entity that the person was helpful in pursuit of the perpetrator of the alleged crime. That usually involves going to the law enforcement agency, but not always. You can, um, other qualifying entities include the judge of the, the district where it's involved, uh, but you gotta get an entity to certify that the person was helpful. Once that's done and once your other evidence is gathered, then a petition is filed, the U petition. And that's where the, the time comes in of waiting for that petition to be both adjudicated and a visa available to the person. Um, I have a lot of clients who often say that they are being accused of a crime because the accuser wants a U visa. Um, yeah, so the, the burden, burden of proof is something like a preponderance of evidence. Um, yeah, so the what's being discussed here is this idea that people kind of gen up the facts underlying a U visa and falsely accuse um, somebody of having committed a crime. Uh, I'm not aware of statistics on how often that happens, but the concern is very often articulated. One, one thing to mention is that the fact that a U petition is granted doesn't by itself have any legal consequence to the person who's the alleged perpetrator of the crime. So if I allege that Jules broke my nose and I get a U visa because of it. Um, that entire file is confidential. So it's not the case that Seattle Police Department says, aha, Greg 
acquired a U petition because Jules broke his nose. And so we're going to swoop in and charge it with third degree assault. Um, that doesn't happen. It might be the case that the US, or sorry, that the alleged accuser um, feels bad and doesn't want to be accused of a crime, um, but it's not going to have a consequence for that person if the U petition gets approved. Now, different court, different story, of course, if the person is recording reporting the crime um, to law enforcement, of course. Does that um, kind of flesh out the question you had, Dr. Bobadilla? Awesome. Looks like it does. Um, yeah, I think unless we get another last minute question, I think that we're perfectly done. So thank you again. Really appreciate it. I know that, you know, time is precious. So we always really are so grateful for our speakers to that volunteer their time. Thank you again. Thanks for the invitation. I, I think I'm gonna have to swoop in for next year, next week's seminar. That sounds really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be a it's going to be a doozy, I think. So well, I'll be happy to see you guys on the attendee list next week. And to everybody who's still logged in and we have our contact information up here, we would be happy to field a more specific questions or if you ever need to consult on a case. Um, here we are. And you're welcome to be in touch. Careful what you wish for. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> thank you so much again. All right. Yeah, have thank a good you week, for everyone. the opportunity. Thank you both.